Welcome to uh, MCC TV's Tech Talk. This is a special edition this evening. We're down at the at Michigan Alternative and Renewable Energy Center uh, for the 25 and 25 Forum. Uh, the forum is based on Proposal 3, uh, current ball ballot issue. Um, and with me is Arne Bozart. Arne is the director of the center here and will be the moderator for this evening's program. And I guess the big question, Arne, is just what is your objective for this evening? Well, thanks uh, for uh, having me on, uh, Jeff. Um, the objective this evening is to provide uh, an, an honest, open, objective opportunity for uh, those in attendance and, and hopefully those who watch your program to learn more about the Proposal 3 ballot initiative. Uh, and we'll be examining both sides of the initiative, both uh, those arguments for and those uh, uh, arguments uh, not in favor of the initiative. And uh, our goal is to educate, to inform, and to provide an opportunity for those of us uh, who have to step in the ballot box on uh, November 6 to make an informed decision. Oh, good. Uh, currently, the uh, the renewable uh, portfolio standard is 10% for 2015. That's and, correct. And, and uh, Proposal 3, if passes, then would ramp that up to 25%? Correct. 25% by 2025. 25. And there are some, some details connected with that that, that uh, everyone needs to uh, sort of understand and, and, and read up on, but that's the gist of it, uh, moving Michigan's renewable portfolio standard from 10% by 2015 to 25% by 2025. Okay, thank you, for Arne. We're looking forward to the forum tonight. Should be interesting. Please join us. I'll introduce myself. My name is Arne Bozart. For those of you who have not met me, I'm the director of the facility here, the Michigan Alternative and Renewable Energy Center. Uh, Merrick for short, and that's how we'll refer to us uh, from this point on. Uh, I'm your host this evening, but this uh, event this evening is sponsored by and was organized by the Muskegon Area Sustainability Coalition, uh, an organization that was formed in 2006 as part of a greater network of sustainability coalitions throughout uh, West Michigan and the Lakeshore region. This is a forum uh, meant to uh, really uh, do a thorough examination of Proposal 3, uh, the 25 by 25 uh, ballot proposal that addresses the question of renewable energy. And uh, I think we have experts on hand who will examine both sides of the question. And we're going to start actually with an overview here in a moment uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Bruce Goodman, who's a senior partner with Barnum Law Firm and he will uh, address specifically uh, the uh, constitutional amendment question, which is a, perhaps a complex uh, sort of override or uh, additional dimension of this ballot proposal that I think is a bit of a consternation for a lot of people, and Bruce will help us understand that. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Bruce Goodman and let him introduce the legal issue for you. We'll see how Aaron does his Jim Lehrer tonight. <laughs> I'm going to step down here because it's a lot more comfortable. Uh, some of us that do this all the time forget that renewable portfolio standard and all of these terms are really um, foreign to a lot of people who don't work in the electric uh, uh, field. I've been an energy attorney for, for 20 years and sometimes I have to stop and say RPS, renewable portfolio standard. So for those of you that are uninitiated, the map that Aaron put up there is the various states have required that their electric generation come from renewable energy uh, in a certain amount. You saw New York, I think, was 29%. Uh, Michigan's current standard is 10%. So that's what we talk about when we say RPS, and that's what those percentages are about. Tonight I'm going to be setting the table for the ballot initiative. I can see we're going to lose the left-hand column a little but uh, I'm going to try to, to lay out what the issue is that you're going to be voting on on November 6th. And the uh, best place to start is to just give the background that there was an initiative petition that was signed by about 500,000 citizens of the state of Michigan to put a ballot proposal before the electorate uh, to add a new Section 55 to the Michigan Constitution and it would be entitled Michigan's Clean Energy, excuse me, Clean Renewable Electric Energy Standard, and it's been designated as Proposition 3. I don't watch TV very much, but I suspect everybody out here has seen all the ads and they're probably going to throw them all. 
So I'm going to try to set the context for the discussion tonight. I'm going to talk about the constitutional amendment process, perhaps why that was the chosen route for this particular um, uh, endeavor. I'm going to talk about the regulatory compact that the Michigan utilities operate under. And then I'm going to put the actual ballot proposal language up on the screen. I hope everybody can, can read uh, from where they're at and see the screen, because I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to put a bunch of slides up there and then you read it. So first of all, the Michigan Constitution uh, has in it provisions as to how it can be amended. Uh, it was adopted in 1963, and it has three different ways that the Constitution can be amended. One is the legislature can say, gee, we'd like to change the Constitution. If they get two-thirds vote of each house, uh, they then send it to the electorate, put on the ballot, give them a ballot number, and the electorate gets to decide. That's one way you can get the constitutional amendment on the ballot. Second way is the way that we're looking at right now, and that is you get petition signatures equal to 10% of the voters in the last gubernatorial <coughs> election. If you get certified, you get on the ballot. Um, if you recall back in July, there was a lot of controversy of who was going to be on the ballot, who wasn't, who had valid signatures, whose, whose petition was clear enough so people could um, decide what the issue was. This particular ballot proposal really wasn't very controversial. More than enough signatures, the language was pre-approved, so there really wasn't any controversy about what was being asked for. Uh, after it was certified, <coughs> a 100-page statement was agreed upon with the Election Commission. That's what's going to appear on the ballot, the 100-page statement. Not all the words, excuse me, 100 words. <laughs> <laughs> The 100 word statement is going to be on the ballot. But tonight I'm going to put the whole language that would be section 55 up on the screen so that you can see the five or six provisions. The last way to amend our Constitution is to have a constitutional amendment, excuse me, a constitutional convention. And if you recall, in the last election, the citizens of Michigan were asked, do you want to? convene a constitutional convention to adopt a new, or to propose a new constitution for the state of Michigan. And that went down to defeat overwhelmingly. Michigan said, no, 1963 constitution is a great constitution. For those of you that are as old as I am, you can remember it was George Romney that headed up that particular uh, constitutional convention. The 63 Michigan Constitution has been amended 35 times since it was adopted in 1964. It's about twice as long as when it started out. The record is that the legislature has proposed amendments 49 times, and the electorate has adopted 22 of those proposals. The initiative approach, the one we're talking about tonight, has occurred 31 times, and 13 times those proposals have been adopted. So you can see the batting average in constitutional amendments is less than 50%. This is a slide that isn't worth reading. This is an important slide. Here are some of the successful amendments that have been put into the Constitution of the Central Region. Here are some of the failures. <coughs> I 
Now, there is a different way to, for the petition uh, process to put something into effect in Michigan, and that's to propose a statute to the electorate and ask the electorate to adopt the statute. It's done the same, it's done in a very similar way to the constitutional amendment approach. There's a petition drive that takes place. This particular drive doesn't need as many signatures as the constitutional amendment approach. You only need 8% of the gubernatorial uh, vote in the prior election. But Michigan has a very unique process. A lot of states just say, okay, you've got the signatures, it goes on the ballot. In Michigan, what happens is the particular proposal, and let's assume that this proposal that we're talking about tonight had been proposed as a statute instead of as a constitutional amendment. The language would have gone to the legislature and they would have had 40 days to consider the language and to say, yep, we like that, we're going to adopt that as a statute for the state of Michigan. Or they could have said, nope, we think it stinks, but we don't think we want this, we're going to let the people decide. <laughs> or they could have said, well, this isn't exactly what we want. Maybe we'll adopt something a little bit different. And so then they adopt a different piece of legislation. If that happens, both proposals go on the ballot. The one that the legislature adopted and the one that the petitioners proposed. So if both of them are on the ballot, what happens is the one that gets the most votes is the one that's adopted. In any case, once a statute is adopted by the electorate, a modification is possible only in two ways. First way is if three-fourths of, three of each house of the legislature votes to change it, then it can be changed. Alternatively, you have another election saying, gee, that, that amendment, excuse me, that statute that was adopted three years ago, we don't like it anymore, we're going to change it. The reason I'm taking time with this slide is that a lot of people have asked the question, well, why is this a constitutional amendment? Why didn't we just have this process go into place? And I'm hoping that some of the people tonight will talk about the rationale. I did some reading just uh, over the weekend, and I saw where at least one of the uh, people responsible for the petition drive said that they didn't want the legislature to have this opportunity to take the piece of uh, proposed legislation and to, to consider it and perhaps modify it in a way that wasn't what was initially intended. And that that's why they chose the constitutional uh, uh, amendment route. Because it's potentially less confusing. There's only one proposal on the ballot. And it's more difficult for an amendment to be modified or reversed because it requires a two-thirds vote of each house of the legislature and a majority vote in the next election. The legislature can't do it on its own. And when you think about it, the Michigan legislature is 38 senators and 110 representatives. Um, and I'll leave it to you to, to think about uh, what, if, what would have happened had this proposal gone to the legislature uh, this last summer for its consideration. One of the things that I find that people Five more minutes? Okay. One of the things that I find that people don't quite understand is the regulatory compact that our utilities operate under. Um, as you know, our electric utilities at one time had a complete monopoly over the ability to supply energy to all of its customers. Uh, through a number of different pieces of legislation, that monopoly has been reduced to 90%. 10% of the customers of the utilities can go elsewhere. The other 90% uh, 
have to buy their electricity from the local utility. In exchange for this monopoly, the utilities have agreed, one, that they can have their rates regulated by the Michigan Public Service Commission, and two, that they will serve every customer out there. They won't pick and choose and say, gee, that customer is too far away, or we don't like that customer. They have to serve everybody. Now, utilities earn a profit when they spend money building things. If they build a power plant, they're entitled to the cost of that power plant plus a reasonable profit. And most recently, that was determined to be 10.5% return on common equity, or 6.586 overall rate of return. When they build things, they make money for their shareholders. When they buy things, when they buy power from a wind farm or a solar farm or an adjacent utility, they can't mark it up. Imagine Meyer going out and buying corn, paying a dollar for an ear of corn and coming and putting it in the marketplace and only being able to charge a dollar. That's what happens when you force utilities to buy power from somebody else. And as you can imagine, they don't much like that. They do it when they need to, but they'd much rather be building things. The reason I bring this up is I think this is one of the underlying issues of this whole campaign, is who's going to build the future generation in Michigan? Is it going to be the utilities, or is it going to be outside third parties? And I hope that comes up in today's discussion. What is the amendment that we're talking about today? It provides as a, as a matter of Michigan policy that 25% of the generation of electricity in our state will come from one of these five types of renewable energy sources. Section 1 gives you the definition. Section 2 sets out the details. This is going to be three consecutive slides. Section 3 covers how will the ratepayers pay for this energy. <laughs> Number 4 is the protection against unreasonable increases in rates due to the renewable generation. I'm going to leave this one up here for a few minutes. A little extra time. Important thing to note here, and I'm sure you'll hear this during the discussion, is the increase due to the renewable energy shall not exceed 1% doesn't say anything about any increases in rates that might be due to some other reason. No increases in coal costs, increases in diesel fuel costs, increases in collective bargaining agreements. It just says that when you look at how much more you might be paying for energy because of renewable energy, it can't be more than 1%. Section 5 talks about Michigan jobs.
And number six is a careful attorney saying, you know, if some of this is unlawful for whatever reason, the whole thing won't fail. Finally, as I explained earlier, you just read what the petition signatories signed on to and what Section 55 of the Michigan Constitution would say if the ballot proposal succeeds. This is what's going to appear on the ballot. State actually, uh, as, as we have agreed uh, previously, given the sheer number of experts here, we're going to forgo the usual reading of resumes and portfolios. These are all highly competent, very successful people in their field. And um, I'll just uh, identify them. Uh, James Cliff, Mr. Cliff is here from Michigan Environmental Council in Lansing. Uh, Ms. Nancy Moody from DT Energy, also representing CARE, Coalition for Michigan. Uh, and, and by the way, I will suggest to each of the panel members, since we're not reading resumes and doing a thorough uh, uh, review, if you will, of your credentials, if you want to say a few words about sort of who you represent, I'm thinking, for example, on CARE, uh, that might be in order. Uh, Mr. Art Toy uh, represents uh, the renewable energy business sector for Elements Energy. Uh, Mr. Wes Eklund. President of Fleet Engineers, a local, very long-standing, successful manufacturing um, uh, business uh, with in the automotive <laughs> trucking sector. Uh, Ms. Tiffany Hartung with the Sierra Club of uh, West Michigan, maybe Michigan. She'll, Michigan she'll explain yeah. what her uh, what her territory is, and then Ms. Cindy Larson, the president of our Muskegon Lakeshore Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're sort of going to go down the row by design, uh, starting with uh, James Cliff and Nancy Moody. They sort of represent the big picture, the state perspective. Then we'll ask Art and, and Wes to sort of address uh, this question from the business perspective. And then Tiffany and Cindy from the, 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 the nonprofit, the, 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 the sort of the 501 organizations that also have a real stake in this. And so I think. By the time we've heard from all of these folks, uh, we'll have a, a good overview of what their thoughts are, and after that, we'll go to questions and answers. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate everyone coming out tonight, uh, learning a little bit more about Proposal 3. Um, really quickly, Michigan Environmental Council is an umbrella organization of uh, environmental, conservation, faith-based groups across the state working on environmental issues. A um, little less known is the fact that we intervene in utility rate cases on behalf of residential ratepayers. Uh, we have done so for about the past 10 years, um, and it kind of provides us a little kind of deeper knowledge of the workings of the utilities. Um, we also were very involved with the passage of Public Act 295 of 2008. That was a statute that is bringing us up to 10% renewable energy by 2008. Um, I'm going to kind of just jump right into it here since we don't have much time um, and just kind of address what I think are kind of some of the big myths out there. And, and unfortunately, you know, um, there's no truth in advertising um, required when you get to legislative uh, uh, electoral campaign. So there's lots of uh, facts and figures being thrown out and I think a lot without basis, unfortunately. I think the biggest myth out there today is the fact that, that renewable energy costs more than the rest of energy out there. And the, the truth is, is as of this year, actually, that that's false. Uh, the city of Holland just entered into a contract for wind energy at four and a half cents a kilowatt hour last week, slowly escalates to six cents a kilowatt by 2022. If you look at our big utilities, they each charge, in the case of, of Detroit Edison, 6.86 cents for all the non-renewable energy they generate. In the case of consumer energy, it's about 7.4 cents. 
So what we've seen for the first time, and this has been happening since we passed Public Act 295, wind contracts started at 11 and a half, then they were nine, then they were six, and now they're, they're four and a half. Uh, DTE has a project in the thumb, it's called the Echo Wind Project. Um, given their construction costs, they predict a capacity factor of 46%. That would bring, we think, the, the cost of that under five cents a kilowatt hour. So again, the fact is, is that this is cheaper energy now, and it has long-term stability. These are contracts that you can lock into for 20 years. So we think this 25% will actually be the stable, safe bet that will help keep rates low. And that's why there's a guarantee written into it. That 25% slice won't cause your rates to go up more than 1%. And if you look at the rest of rates, for residential rate payers since 2005, our rates have been going up on average in Michigan at 9.5% a year. Um, if you look at overall rates, all classes, at 7% a year since 2005 is the rate escalation we've seen, mainly driven by fossil fuel prices going through the roof. The, the price of coal has doubled in the last seven years. A big part of that cost of coal is getting it to Michigan. We use 35 million tons a year. It takes about, from the western states, it takes about six gallons of diesel fuel to get every ton here. That means we're spending that, we spend about $1.5 billion on coal every year. About 500 million of that is diesel fuel just to get it here. The end result, unfortunately, of our over-reliance on coal, 60% statewide, 70% in the case of DTE, <coughs> is the public health impacts that we're seeing. Um, and we did a study in 2009 on the public health impacts of just the nine oldest coal plants in Michigan, a firm out of Boston called Environmental Health and Engineering. They found public health damages and costs of $1.5 billion a year being incurred by Michigan residents. And this is, this is um, asthma attacks, 70,000 asthma attacks, people missing work, hospital admissions in Michigan, 160 premature deaths. Um, nationwide, those same nine plants, about 600 deaths. So our thought is let's transition to cleaner energy. We can do it. It's cheaper. It's better for us. It's better for our public health, better for the planet. Thank you. I don't think that was two minutes. <laughs> My name is Nancy Moody, and I am indeed wearing two hats tonight. First, I work for DTE Energy, and uh, while you might think, why do they have the gas person here, we do also own Detroit Edison, which is the state's largest electric company, and we are the largest <laughs> renewable energy producer in the state of Michigan. I'm also here as a representative of the CARE Coalition, and I've got some other members with me up here, Cindy and Wes, and their organizations are also members of CARE. We have about 1,000 businesses and organizations who have heard about it, the Clean, Affordable, Reliable Energy Coalition. And uh, I invite you all to join to look for more facts and figures on this in the next two weeks before the election actually takes place. Please go to careformish.com. It's careformish.com. We won't have time to cover all of the ground tonight. Uh, and, you know, we could spend hours uh, debating what my good friend, and Cliff, <laughs> James is my good friend, um, the things that he just said. But I would just like to say this. This is a constitutional amendment. And uh, Bruce did a very nice job describing what the Constitution is and how it works. And once you have a constitutional amendment, the only way to amend it is to go back to the Constitution. So from our perspective, from the CARE Coalition perspective, it is very inflexible. It's asking us to put into the Constitution 25% renewable energy by the year 2025, whether we need more generation in this state or not. And irrespective of costs, because we can debate those from now until the cows come home. And as an old Muskegon girl, I know what the cows are and how long it takes to get them home sometimes. Right, you guys? <laughs> By the way, just to make sure, just to make sure that I had some friends in the audience tonight, I do have some family members here, so if you hear people actually cheer for me, those are my brothers and sisters. <laughs> and uh, thank you. I'm sure we'll have a lot of time to discuss the ballot proposal with the Q&A.
Thank you. Good evening. My name is Art Toy, one of the principals with Four Elements Energy, our firm designs and installs renewable energy systems. We have the honor of spending the last year and a half here in the Muskegon Oceana County area installing renewable energy systems such as solar electric and solar hot water. Uh, from a personal perspective, I was, I guess I was part of the legislative process when uh, uh, Public Act 295 was enacted in 2008, which allowed for true net metering. In the late 90s, I used to attend legislative hearings, and I, I didn't have gray hair then, but I do now. It, it, was, it was quite a task, if you, unless you were willing to attend uh, hearings every year or at least read the newsletters. But uh, being a, a stubborn person that I am, I did attend the hearings and did get to have my word uh, placed on the record. And I can tell you that the legislative process is, is quite a lengthy process, as it should be. I mean, you do need to look at all the facts here, true. But from the perspective of a company, uh, we have been hiring people. In fact, we are looking and we're currently interviewing to bring on another person on board here. Uh, our workload is uh, pretty full. We're uh, full up to the rest of the year now. Uh, we wish we could be even busier to hire more. Unfortunately, the, many of our clients have to go through a lottery process through uh, Consumers Energy to sign up for their uh, solar program. So it's not for uh, lack of, uh, of a want out there. There are certain people who want to sign up, yet they are held back through a lottery process. Um, so with that, I, I guess I would have relinquished some of my minutes to the Honorable Gen General James Cliff and turn the microphone over to Wes. Hey, thanks, I appreciate it. Um, before I get started, I want to make sure that uh, nobody misconstrues me as being against renewable energy. I'm not. I'm actually for it. What I do have issues with is when we, you know, we pass laws mandating energy policy in our Constitution, which I don't think is necessarily the right place for that to happen. Uh, we, we live in a representative republic, a true democracy where you know, we could just uh, call a question and have everybody vote on every issue that comes up. There's a reason we we elect uh, legislators to work on our behalf. It's their job to spend every day in Lansing debating issues, vetting issues, uh, doing the research and trying to actually figure out what's best for their constituents. And in this case, the legislature is, is being bypassed and I don't think that's necessarily the best way to, uh, to do public policy in Michigan. Otherwise, we would just uh, outlaw the state legislature and, and rule by ballot measures. And I don't think necessarily you're gonna get the right answers when you do that. Um, specifically, as I looked at this proposal, and I spent several sessions of a couple hours each um, researching information and uh, when you have a ballot proposal of about 100 words, the, digger you, the deeper you dig into the proposal, the more, um, whichever perspective you take, whether you're in favor of passing this or not, for whatever reason, it requires you to look at a, a whole wide variety of assumptions and perspectives on what is going to happen that can't possibly be spelled out in a 100-word proposal. There's, there's issues like a $12 billion investment in renewables that's going to be paid for by someone. Who's going, to, who's going to make that investment? Now, it could be the power generating companies or it could be third parties who are investors looking to build something in which they're going to make some money. And they're going to sell that energy then back to the power companies who will then sell it to us. If that happens, we know the power companies aren't going to like it because they can't make money on it. Our statute requires that utilities make money on invested capital. So if the energy that you use is not being produced by the power company, their shareholders will not earn a return. They can only pass that through. In fact, for every kilowatt hour that they pass through, they lose money because they can't cover the cost of handling the transmission of power from the generating source from a third party to the power company and getting it to you and do all the building and collection and all those things. So my suggestion with respect to $12 billion investments is follow the money. Who's it going to? 
are the power companies, and this isn't spelled out in the proposal, it's one of the concerns I have. Um, another one of the concerns in the ads is, as this is talked about, is a jobs proposal, and things like job years have been used to uh, you know, kind of be thrown out there in terms of what is going to happen. Uh, the proposal asks for the legislature to pass laws um, requiring Michigan companies to do some of these things, but those of us in Muskegon have been watching ships come in from Europe over the past few weeks bringing in parts that were not made in Michigan for the current wind farms that are being put up. So I, I would uh, caution us and, and understand that if a third party is going to put up a wind farm, they may or may not be required to purchase these pieces and parts from Michigan companies. And you would be uh, basically beholden to the legislature to come up with the proper laws that would require these to be built in Michigan. In that case, it's possible they could be more costly than those being made in other places and businesses built in competition. Uh, who, can, who can produce more efficiently and more effectively? Uh, those are some other concerns. Uh, the 1%, the utilities to be able to pass 1% uh, maximum with respect to the renewables um, year after year uh, also concerns me. There's issues about that being thrown into court uh, and challenged. We, as a business that uh, buys a lot of power in Michigan, I know my, my rates have gone up um, more than 20% since the 2008 PA 295 has gone into effect. Now, I can't dig into my power bill and, and understand exactly why that is. In some cases, it's the cost of coal. There's, a, there's probably a host of reasons. However, none of you can figure that out either. It takes a, an energy lawyer like Bruce here to kind of dig through some of these facts and get to the bottom of it, which is really one of the big reasons I, uh, I'm concerned with legislating with a proposal like this because there's, there's just so many unanswered questions. And I see an arm waving at me, so I've got to cut my two minutes off. But that would be the bottom line for me is, is that they, the deeper I dig into this, the more questions I have and the, and the more difficult it is for me to to follow the assumptions and figure out exactly where this thing is going to go. I, I think there's lots of unintended consequences. So, um, as Art introduced, um, my name is Tiffany Hartung and I'm with the Sierra Club, the Michigan chapter, and I'm a campaign representative for our Beyond Coal campaign. And I'm based here um, in Muskegon, which makes this uh, venue really convenient for me. Um, it's, a, it's a great location. Um, so I just wanted to take a, a moment to say a little bit about why the Sierra Club is supporting Proposal 3 um, and why we're a part of uh, the, uh, joining the more than 300 small businesses, public health advocates, uh, labor unions, the NAACP, faith leaders, and uh, other folks like, uh, like Art um, um, and uh, James uh, in this campaign. Um, we believe um, that um, that Proposal 3 will create jobs, uh, rein in energy, rising energy cost, um, and reduce pollution in our air and water. It's clear that using more wind and solar will reduce air pollution and make our air and water cleaner. Um, right now, uh, Michigan gets about 60% of our energy from burning coal. Uh, burning coal releases harmful pollutants that, such as lead, arsenic, soot, and smog into the air we breathe. This pollution uh, causes a host of serious health, health problems. Um, especially for children and senior citizens, uh, the most vulnerable among us, um, such as asthma, respiratory illness, cancer, neurological problems, and heart disease. Proposal 3 will reduce air pollution in Michigan, um, bringing us more clean energy uh, to, and rely, requiring us to rely less on coal. Um, and that's why the Michigan Nurses Association has endorsed it. Uh, they call this, um, this um, proposal uh, the most important public health initiative in decades for Michigan. Um, so it, it's really important. And as James talked about, that Michigan coal-fired power plants currently cost Michiganders and Michigan families $1.5 billion each year in health care cost damages from, from the health impacts. There's an estimated 250,000 asthma attacks each year caused by Michigan's nine oldest coal-fired power plants, one of those right here on Lake Muskegon. Uh, there's over 230,000 children in Michigan and 700,000 adults with asthma. 
Um, in addition to uh, the air pollution, uh, coal-fired power plants re release uh, toxic air pollutants, uh, such as mercury. Uh, mercury from coal-fired power plants gets into our, into our um, air and our water, um, and it accumulates in the fish we eat, uh, and then consequently in us. Uh, mercury is a potent neurotoxin, uh, especially dangerous to uh, children and, um, um, and feed developing fetuses. Uh, mercury exposure in a child or a developing fetus uh, affects a child's ability to walk, talk, learn, and, and develop. Um, mercury pollution in the Great Lakes. Uh, any of you who fish know that all of our Great Lakes have mercury fish advisories. All of our inland lakes and most of our inland rivers do as well. Um, so the reason that Sierra Club supports this is that we see that uh, in Michigan, we have an important choice to make right now. If we continue to rely on outdated, dirty sources like coal, uh, we're going to continue to pay more for health costs and damages to our Great Lakes and other pre precious natural resources. Um, and we don't think it's right to continue down this path of the status quo while ch children are suffering from asthma attacks and res residents are getting ill from other respiratory illnesses and cardiovascular diseases when we have a choice right now um, where we can get more of our energy from clean renewable sources. Um, it's been talked about a little bit, and I'm sure we'll, it'll, it'll come up more in questions, but the reason for um, moving towards a, a ballot initiative as opposed to a legislative approach is because uh, those of you who are, are following uh, our things in Lansing uh, know that there's not a lot productive happening in Lansing right now in our legislature. Um, and then combine that with the um, the control um, and the clout that our, our big utilities in Michigan have in the legislature and imagine trying to pass any sort of energy, uh, productive energy policy in, in that venue. And so uh, that's why uh, we're, uh, this campaign is, has taken it to a ballot proposal. Uh, there's over 130,000 Michigan residents, Michigan voters, uh, that signed a petition to get up in the ballot. So uh, this is something that Michigan voters want. Thank you. Um, the Muskegon Lakeshore Chamber of Commerce is a countywide chamber, and uh, we have members, 1,100 members, and they range from our largest employers like Alcoa and Mercy uh, Health Partners to Ruth Ann's Ice Cream and the Cheese Lady. So we represent all kinds of business, and of course, uh, the bills for business when it comes to utility bills are much, much higher than the residential bills. Uh, for us, this is also about a constitution, the constitutional amendment. The Muskegon Lakeshore Chamber has a track record of supporting the development of renewable and alternative energy. Uh, your local chamber was the lead agency in advocating for this building, the Michigan Alternative and Renewable Energy Center. I had to write this down because this issue is so complicated. It's so easy to get off track, so I, I did write my remarks down. Uh, we have publicly supported the diversification of Michigan's energy portfolio but through voluntary measures and incentives, not constitutional mandates. And we strongly support energy efficiency measures uh, because they reduce consumption. And by reducing consumption, we also can protect our environment. That's a whole area of, of energy that isn't even being discussed by this initiative. We believe energy technologies uh, that need to be reliable, efficient, and affordable. Sustainable energy technology should be highly prioritized and valued. We do not believe that science and technology development can be mandated through constitutional amendments. Science and technology development is innovative and changing rapidly. I think we all know we're living in this age when technology is just moving at such a fast pace that it's very hard to keep up with it. Uh, so therefore, um, we, we, a mandate could even slow down advances in uh, science and technology, and that may mean it won't be sustainable. If you look at those amendment changes, thank you, Bruce, um, since 1963, most of them were about taxes or the drinking age. Um, so there is reasons why uh, things related to science and technology were not part of that. Our local manufacturers are major innovators and users of electricity. The cost and reliability of energy has a major impact on the location of manufacturing facilities and that impacts job creation. Uh, we can't ignore the people and the prosperity in the industries of automotive, aerospace, food processing, and healthcare, all major users of energy. 
To retain and grow these industries, we must keep energy efficient, reliable, and affordable. It's the promotion of innovation that will move the economy forward. Innovation is the key to a sustainable economy, not constitutional mandates. All right. Thank you. So there you are. Um, first of all, let me, uh, looks like an afterthought. I'm sorry, I just wanted to correct myself, I think. I think I said 130,000 signatures. It should be 530, is that right? Yes. Apologies, I'm, I'm awfully tired. Yeah. 530,000 Michigan yes. citizens yeah. signed a petition, correct? Yes. Correct, thanks. So, um, you've heard from our panel, and uh, <laughs> Truth in Advertising will get you in a minute. Truth in Advertising, uh, we brought together for you seven uh, people who are very expert in their collective uh, respective fields, so I'm very confident that as we now move into the question and answer segment that um, you'll be able to get your questions answered. I'm, I'm going to sort of work the room back and forth, make sure that everyone uh, uh, has a chance to be heard. Um, I'll again ask that your questions be concise to the point and likewise the panel members will respond uh, in kind um, and we'll move around. Um, I do want to recognize a couple of people who joined us. We have State Representative Marsha Hovey Wright uh, in the room. She came in earlier. Hello Marsha. And we also have City Commissioner Leah Markowski here uh, from the City of Muskegon. Uh, pleased to have her here. Are there any other elected officials who joined us? Uh, sorry? Judge Nolan. Good evening, Judge Nolan. Um, so, um, I think we're ready to begin the, uh, the Q&A. So, I, I, I see we have an, an eager first question here. So, we'll, we'll go ahead. Well, I'll talk about coal. Um, <coughs> coal has been restricted or upgraded. As power plants age out, they need to be replaced or updated. That it is, um, is one of the options for the power companies to replace those aging out coal plants with alternative energy plants so that they're producing the alternative energy? Um, and is it feasible along the line of coal to continue improving the, um, taking the, the byproducts out of the air so that there's less air pollution? Maybe Nancy, you want to start with that? Right, love to start with that one. So yes, the uh, many of the coal plants in Michigan are getting older, like the BC Cobb plant that's 61 years old and on its last legs at this point in time. Uh, what the utilities in the state of Michigan very much believe in is a diversified portfolio. So just like your finances at home, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. So we think that coal is a reasonable fuel and that we're heavily coal-centric uh, in Michigan right now, but moving away from that. Some of the plants are being retrofitted with a lot of pollution control equipment, and that pollution control equipment has lowered emissions by up to 90% in some cases. Dramatic reductions in air emissions. We have the cleanest air in Michigan and in the United States today that we've had in many decades. But that doesn't mean that we don't think renewable energy is a really viable and great way to go with some of our portfolio. We have a 10% standard we're working to fulfill right now. We're about halfway to that standard and it becomes completed in 2015. Our purpose is to say, let's move to 2015 and go forward. My own CEO at Detroit Edison and DTE Energy is very, very strongly pro-renewables. He's already said publicly, we'll do more. But we don't think putting anything like this in the Constitution is the right thing because I think Cindy said it really well. Technologies can change so quickly. And right now, a 25% standard, based on the kind of state Michigan is, which is a wind state, we're not really a solar state, we've maxed out hydro, biomass produces very, very little energy, so it's going to be wind. And it will be about 3,100 turbines to get to a 25% portfolio. We think that's probably too much, and technology can change too fast, so not the right way to go in the Constitution. Thanks. Quickly. 
Um, yeah, it's interesting coming from a company, DTE, that gets 95% of its energy from coal and nuclear power right now. So um, they've got many of those old nine plants are on their list. It's 94%. 94%. <laughs> um, many of those old coal plants are on the list. And before a utility can close down an old coal plant, it has to go to the grid operator and say, do you need this plant to stabilize the grid? Is this plant needed to run? Um, DTE originally put a couple of those plants on that list to retire, potentially retire them. They have withdrawn all of those applications now from MISO. So they plan to run that old coal facility except one up in the thumb, it's called Harbor Beach. A little tiny plant is the only one they've agreed to close. Um, it's my perspective. Then, then they've got a license in for a new nuclear plant. So when you look at flexibility, I think, okay, what's more inflexible? Dropping $10 billion into a plant where you're tied into whatever technology we have today, or putting 1.5% renewable energy every year for the next 10 years where we can keep learning and getting better and getting better and getting better, kind of you think of your cell phone and how much it's improved in the last 10 years. Having smaller discrete portions of renewable energy, I think provides more flexibility going forward than big baseload power plants that do two things, ties you into the same technology for 40 to 60 years and buying that fuel, regardless of what happens to the price for the next 40 to 60 years. That's, in my mind, inflexible and dangerous for ratepayers. We must move on. Uh, a question here. Uh, I just have two quick questions, more on just facts. Um, is it true that the, uh, like DTE, like the coal plants and everything, don't they sell the energy to the grid? And then the grid, okay. So the generation capacity of our state doesn't really matter so much. It does to the MISO or the grid, right? But when we generate the energy, it gets sold to the MISO and then the MISO buys it back. Is that right? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, we sell their excess energy to the grid, but they have the obligation to serve that I talked about earlier where they have to they have to have electricity to deliver to their customers. Uh, if somebody else can supply it more cheaply, maybe they'll buy it from somebody else. So not all of the grid, not all the energy gets sold to the grid first. Just the access. Keyword? <coughs> okay. Anybody disagree? That's pretty cool. Okay. It's deepest we want to get tonight. <laughs> so we can afford we can to get into tonight. Afterwards. <laughs> if you have Next question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and also... Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we need to move on to the question. Uh, Colorado shows on your slide at 30%, and I'm somewhat familiar that the major utility provider there fought tooth and nail against having that mandate rise to that level. Once it was in place and they realized how much they could invest and innovate, uh, they went whole hog and they are actually embracing and, and ahead of schedule, as I understand it, to hit that 30% level by, by eyes aren't good in 2020. Uh, is, that, is that the date on the slide? Yeah. Um, if any of the panelists are familiar, can they speak to the uh, turn of position that that major utility made in Colorado and why, why that might be so? Um, again, I think what we're finding is around the country, more and more utilities realizing the benefits of renewable energy. We now have five states that are already generating more than 20% of their energy from renewable energy. That's Hawaii, California, South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa have all blended in more than 20% renewable, no, no diminishment of reliability. So the grid operators are finding that much power kind of easily to mesh in. Um, I think Excel, again, I've read some, and some of the people from Colorado have been coming to Michigan, kind of endorsing our proposal, um, their ex-energy regulator uh, among them. But the idea is, is they found that 
kind of the stability it provided what was good long term. Aaron, can I just add something? I think that it, it's really good to uh, ask everybody to take a note of caution when they look at how much renewable energy any state has as its standard because depending on the state, like New York where you've got Niagara Falls, you can have an awful lot of renewable energy without really having anything new. So you have to be really careful what you look at. The second thing is utilities definitely make money off of these things. DTE Energy would definitely make money if we had a 25% renewable energy standard. We believe that the costs are much higher than conventional energy, which is already built, produced, running. We know what those costs are. Everything we talk about with this 25% portfolio is futuristic and it's theory. We know what we're dealing with right now. And so I would just say, take a note of caution on all of these, whatever other utilities in other states are doing. It's not always as easy as it looks on the surface. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I heard uh, reference to nuclear. I'd like to stop you when you track it out so that you're way off base. Um, Germany, Angela Merkel, who is a nuclear physicist, has put up three gigawatts, that's 3,000 megawatts of solar in one month, December 2011. Germany now, on certain days, exports their solar energy outside of the borders. They make so much. Germany has less insulation or power from the sun than we do. Number one. Number two, Japan. Japan and Germany, two of the most advanced societies on the face of this earth meeting the, the Ministry on Industry and Technology has committed twelve billion dollars for photovoltaics, primarily way down photovoltaics in Germany. I'm sorry, in Japan, because of the consequences of the recent nuclear problem. This particular building you're sitting in now, I my friend over here put the solar cells on this building now, almost twelve years ago. These solar cells have never been this is not only in Michigan, but it's on the edge of two lakes, one large, one huge. This solar cell in this building makes power for 13 cents a kilowatt hour with no, I repeat, no subsidies. These solar cells are a dozen years old. It's half the roof. The solar cells in today's world are three times more efficient than if we were to fill the entire roof right here and I can show you all the data because this institution collects that. We can produce 75% in the state of Michigan power. This is a 24,000 square foot. All right, next question. This question is for those that are in favor of the proposal. All the information and questions people talk about here are great, but to me the real question is this. Why would the public want to limit their ability by putting something in the Constitution. Well, I understand the reasons you're going to problem, but why would they want to limit themselves by putting it in the Constitution? The, the bottom line is that it's true, we didn't trust the legislature. Uh, because the utilities own the legislature. Um, and so if you look, if you read our Constitution, I think you look at the first eight words of the Constitution. All political power is inherent in the people. So the people of the state of Michigan decide, is this an issue that should elevate itself to being in the Constitution? Is the right to breathe clean air something that we think should be in our Constitution? Um, I think Bruce did a great introduction here. I think, and you know, I'm convinced that if we would have offered a initiated law and what we would have had to done is go all through the law and change all the provisions to do everything we did. And if the voters would have adopted that, it would have taken a three-quarter vote to amend it any time in the future. They would be attacking us for the inflexibility of that three-quarter vote, where we thought we put the big concepts in the Constitution, we let the legislature implement the details, and put in cost protections so that we know that they have cost is the driving factor, that will take longer to do it. And at any point, if the legislature decides something has changed, situation has changed, this is a bad thing to have in here, they can suspend the program at any time, 
call a timeout because they're authorized to set the interim standards. They could then offer amending or new language on the next electoral ballot and have the people vote on it again. So we think, A, just the fact that the big concepts are there and that there is that flexibility to, to get around it if we would need to in the future is there. Um, We're convinced it will not happen otherwise. And what else on panel chair comments? Well, Wes can help me on this, but I believe that particular argument wasn't one of them. I think our legislature has been interested in alternative energy. It hasn't been, um, because we kind of follow some of that, and we haven't been asked to be pro or con on, on some of those issues. And you mentioned flexibility, which I think is the key um, uh, argument here about the constitutional amendment not being flexible enough for changes. So um, I thought that we, as a state, from a legislative standpoint, we're working toward um, uh, the renegotiation after we get to the 10%, the dialogue is beginning on what is it after we get to that particular point. And I could be wrong on that, but that's how I took it um, based on our, our conversations with people in Lansing. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot more issues to debate. <coughs> One, for instance, being why is, why is 25 percent by 2025 a magic number? It's just because it sounds interesting and it, and it sticks in people's minds. That may or may not be the right percentage for us to have. Um, in fact, the percentage may be much lower, maybe much higher. Um, I, I think the, the issues that Nancy brought up regarding, uh, regarding wind, if we have to go 100 percent wind to get to those standards, you're going to have a lot more wind turbines in places that are not evident today. Arms uh, organization here has it's had wind studies going on at Lake Michigan and there's been a tremendous amount of uh, controversy regarding putting winds, wind uh, windows out in Lake Michigan destroying the, the view. Now there's a lot more information coming forward about maybe we can go further out and if we don't destroy the view maybe there's there's opportunities in the future but there's so much we just don't know today. Uh, the other issue with respect to wind is, as everyone rushes to adopt some of these renewables, and you generate an excess electricity, which wind necessarily has to be somewhat excess for everyone because the wind doesn't always blow. The utilities are, are under statute to provide electricity to the state, even when the wind doesn't blow. So they've got to have backup investment in generating capability or they have to buy that power from somewhere else at whatever the cost may be to supply. Now, if everyone, all the states jump in and, and, some, and build a whole bunch of, uh, of renewable for wind, and now we have more power in this country than we, than we need, okay, that's great. But what, what happens when the wind doesn't blow? We can't store this power today. Well, that's more technology. Let me move on a little bit. Quick response, Mark. Quick response. Quick response. We certainly have the ability to capture that power. We have the Ludington pumping station, which takes up the spinning reserve of Fermi 2. Oh, ask yourself why whatever happened to Fermi 1. <laughs> um, Palisades and Cook. You cannot ramp down a nuclear power plant at a snap of the finger. You must send that spinning reserve nighttime. Where do you send that power? You pump water at the pumping station. You have excess power from a wind farm, you send it into a, a, a system for capture, whether it's a pumping station or storage. Okay. We move on. Next question over here, and I'll be back to the other side. Um, yeah, so uh, Ms. Ms. Moody said something that, uh, that concerned me a, a little bit. Uh, Michigan has uh, the oldest power plant fleet in America. And when talking about the cost of renewable energy, $12 billion to implement that. I, I believe you said something to the effect of um, using what we have now um, is cheaper. Are, am I to understand, are we to understand that um, without this ballot initiative, the utilities will not be upgrading or creating new power sources? And if that's not the case, will you tell us how much it would cost to implement other power sources and what you would use? Mm -hmm. What I would tell you is that our company is forever, constantly, ongoing, studying what our power needs of our customers are for the future. And at this point in time, 
we are building a 10% renewable energy portfolio, and by the year 2015, that is satisfying all of the generation needs of our customers. So that's where we are right now. One of the big problems with the constitutional mandate is that whether we need to build to 25% or not, in other words, whether our customers need the power or not, we would be mandated to build it which seems a little silly because it does cost money. It costs a lot of money. It costs about $12 billion, and that doesn't include all of the costs of transmission that Arden was talking, I think Arden mentioned it, someone did. It doesn't include any of the unintended consequences of, for instance, what if we can't locate the wind turbines in the highest wind zone areas and then your capacity factor goes down. Uh, so we're always looking. Uh, James mentioned the renewable license. We will have a renewable license for Fermi 3. And by the way, Fermi 1 was a pilot. It was not, it was an experimental thing. It had, it was not like anything what Fermi 2 is, which is producing 1,800 megawatts of power, 24 hours, a, or excuse me, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, so what, in the end, in other words, we just want to mix. The Fermi 3 license is good for the next 25 years. For the next 25 years. If Michigan ever really grows again, and we really need another big base load power plant that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, which wind and solar cannot do, then at that point in time that we think we need it, it will be built. It will not be built before that. If we had a constitutional mandate that mandated that, we'd build it whether we needed it or not. Quick follow-up thought from James. Just, yeah, really quickly. I think, you know, this question has been asked, why don't we just wait to 2015? And the truth is, because of some Clean Air Act regulations, utilities are really at a point now where they have to decide, are we going to upgrade our older, older coal plants, or are we going to retire some of these plants? So if we look at DTE's portfolio of plants, Trenton Channel, built in 1949, St. Clair built in 1953, River Rouge built in 1957. You know, I, I submit that it is cheaper to close these plants now um, and replace them with new natural gas capacity, renewable capacity, things that will serve our, our state and our residents better going forward. Real quick. So, James is a great guy, but he doesn't know everything about utilities or utility regulation, which Bruce can help with. We are under the law regulated by the Michigan Public Service Commission. With all of our customers, James is there sometimes, and others, we determine together what the least expensive option for our customers is, giving us a diversified portfolio. It is not cheaper to shut down our old coal plants at this time. We have figured out through new technology ways to make the air clean enough under the clean air laws that are being passed by the Environmental Protection Agency right now to keep some of those plants running for a few more years because it's the cheapest for our customers. That's what we will do. And when it's time to build something else, We'll go to the commission, we'll work with our customers, and we will build something else. Thank you. Let's move on and see what other questions we have on there. A couple of data questions of uh, Mr. Cliff. Um, uh, number one, what is the recent efficiency of the wind turbines that we know of uh, in, in Michigan? The second question is, uh, you mentioned a number of uh, costs uh, of the power coming into the uh, power companies and they're passing it on to the uh, users. Uh, and, and there was a number of those costs that I couldn't keep track of. Uh, and I thank you for that information. But uh, does that, those costs also include the 2.2 uh, cents a kilowatt hour that is paid to the developer for the uh, power that's generated and also the construction subsidies that the taxpayers have to pick up? I mean, how do, how do those costs built into the uh, cost that you uh, quoted? So we'll start with Holland um, at four and a half cents. If you took the production tax credit out of that, um, that tax credit only runs for a limited period of time. Um, so the Anderson Economic Group just came out with a report for our opponents, um, and they put that, pegged that at 0.7 cents is what you would add to the Holland contract if you were to kind of predict what wind would cost after the production tax credit goes away. So that would take Holland up to 5.3 cents 
still less than the utilities are currently charging for the non-renewable resources they have. Um, we did a cost report, it's on our website. There's a handout here talking about 12 questions. The link to that is on this website. This is the only report that's been done with real Michigan data looking at what's the cost of business as usual, what's the cost of building the, these renewable assets, what's the savings in fuel, what's the savings in plant upgrades. The two utilities are predicting that upgrading these plants to meet new Clean Air Act standard, somewhere between four and a half and five and a half billion dollars over the next 10 years. So again, we're looking at lots of costs there. So, oh, capacity factors, we thought in Michigan that we'd be good in like the, the low 30s. What we're now finding is many facilities in Michigan in the high 30s. DTE has announced 46% capacity factor in the thumb. What we found is what we, once we went to higher towers, we went from 80 meters to 100 meters, really kind of opened up the whole bottom of the mitt for really high quality wind resources. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory is now predicting Michigan would have to tap into about 8% of its high quality sites to meet the 25% standard. I actually don't think it's all going to be done with wind. I think solar, especially in the 2018, you know, right around that time, even today, but on a utility scale, by then for the last five years, I expect to see major solar penetration with this. All right, well, back to this side of the room. I'm thinking about CAFE, which was the fuel standard across the fleet for GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And that looks like that mandate actually was a real success because now we have Priuses, we have cars that go 40 miles per gallon, and uh, we also have great capacities in uh, batteries. Not only that, but basically computer-aided design was driven by CAFE. So we now have incredible design skills. Could you compare 25 by 25 to CAFE? What I would say in answering that is that we all want to drive costs down and technology up, and there's a cost associated with all of it. But the CAFE standards you're talking about were developed through regulation and through law, not through constitutional provisions. And I would not recommend locking this thing into a constitutional provision, which you can't change and be flexible with if it's not working out. All right, next question over here. How would you think that uh, closing of the coal plants and going with the renewable standard would affect employment in the state? We've seen many closures of companies in this area, and I'm curious about that. Um, we, we did a, we commissioned Michigan State University to do kind of a jobs analysis, what if Proposal 3 passed. Um, the numbers they came out with was um, 30,000 job years in the construction industry, uh, 44,000 in the operation and maintenance, and about 40,000 job years on the manufacturing side. So it just depends on what kind of slice of the action Michigan companies would get. So you total that up somewhere between 75 and 100,000 job years. But a number of studies around the country that just ask the question, if you look at jobs per kilowatt, what's better? And the, the overall consensus there is that renewables generate more jobs per kilowatt than, than fossil fuels do. You think about it, you're just buying fuel. That money is just kind of leaving the state where with the renewable assets, you're paying people to, again, construct, install, manufacturers. Michigan, number one in the country in clean energy patents. I mean, the question is, is are we going to put that innovation to work, put those ideas to work, and turn them into companies in Michigan? I just have to come on the job years, and this is where, as you look into this deeper and deeper, it gets more and more confusing. I've been doing economic development for 25 years, and I don't think I ever heard Anyone measure job years? And I, that is, those are not jobs. They're measuring, it's a bizarro measurement. 
that I had never even heard before, um, and I study uh, jobs and job creation uh, numbers. So I just want to make that point. That's why this gets really, really confusing. And again, putting something this complicated in the Constitution is just common sense, not right to do. There are so many other ways to get to the goals that we all want, and that is a clean environment as well as prosperity for all of us. I guess just, I have just really quickly, all job prediction modeling in this country is done with job years. The Jedi model, all the major models for predicting job growth in this country is done by job years because it is a more accurate way to measure job creation in the future. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the comes Well, let me remind everyone in the room that if you're just anxious to talk further about some of these points, you'll have about a half hour after the formal Q&A is done. So be sure and uh, connect with uh, any of these individuals to sort of have a more expanded question and answer. Um, next. Um, being in the legislature, um, and I also have a bill that's similar to this proposal, uh, this is not going to happen in the legislature. The only way it's going to happen is this way. Um, not for a lot of years and a lot of changes in who's in power. I just have to respond to that, Representative. In 2008, when you were not yet in the state legislature, James Clift, Nancy Moody, a lot of people from a lot of different industries and a lot of different organizations came together with the state legislature, Republicans and Democrats. We had a Democratic House, we had a Republican Senate. And we put together Michigan's first renewable portfolio standard. It took about 18 months of debate and study and work to figure out what could the unintended consequences be. How much will this cost? Who's going to pay for it? And how much over what time? And it went through and answered as many of those questions as everybody could dream up. And it was a very major piece of policy passed in 2008. When the time comes, I certainly believe that you and your colleague can do it again. Next question. Thank you. My name is Pat Nolan. I'm a personal injury lawyer. Uh, I would like to go in a little different direction than cost. Uh, I have a lot of experience in PBB, Delcon Shield, Agent Orange, asbestos, breast implant litigation. And I listened with a lot of interest to Ms. Hartung's claims that the passage of Proposal 3 is going to significantly and to the advantage of uh, the Michigan citizens uh, help with their health situation. It's going to positively impact the health of Michigan citizens, and I thought maybe someone who's opposed to Proposal 3 could give a rebuttal to that. Any one of the panels? Well, I, I didn't want to really sit here and debate on that because it's a, there's a universe of studies up and down, depending on which scientists you talk to and which statistics you want to believe in. I think we all believe that if you had 100% wind or solar or biomass and hydro or a combination of it that could power our state and you know didn't drive us all into bankruptcy, we'd do it because it would probably be cleaner than coal, which does heavy emissions. I don't, I don't think there's a question about that. But there is a question about how clean the air is today, which is significantly cleaner than it's been in generations. And the rising lung diseases, and my question would be, I'm not quite sure what the correlation is when the air is much cleaner, but the diseases continue to rise. Russ, quick response. Uh, there's, there's such a term, it's called transport, and really a lot of the air that Michiganians breathe is polluted elsewhere and gets transported to us. Um, one of the issues we have is, is we can be the greatest, the, the greatest country on earth and have the cleanest air, but we've still got developing countries like China who are buying some of our old factories and some of our old generating equipment and polluting the air much worse than we are polluting it here. And that air moves around the globe. So I don't think there's a lot of debate about the fact that bad emissions do cause health problems in the general public. The question is how do we solve that? And Putting uh, wind in Michigan is probably going to help New York State and Maine more than it's going to help Michigan. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
All right, we're going to try real hard to get two or three more questions. I've got one right here, and then I'll be back to the other side. Okay, well, first of all, I want to uh, tell Wes that if he looks on his electric bill, my bill, um, when the um, RFP for the 10% went in, I got a surcharge of $2.50 a month on my bill. Well, now it's 53 cents. So that's how much less it costs, about $2 a, a month less. So that's one point. And another point I'd like to bring up is we are talking about percent here. 25% doesn't mean we have to produce 25 more. It just means it's a percent of the whole. And solar and wind both work during peak times, especially solar. So on hot summer days, when you're when the peak is up, and peak electricity, if I'm not mistaken, is way more expensive than baseline electricity. Solar covers that peak. Wind can also cover peak in the winter. So let, let's keep our facts kind of facts. Remember, 25 is 25 percent, not 25 more. So right now we have about 5% renewable energy in Michigan between Consumers Energy and the small utilities and Detroit Edison. So it's 20% more. Solar, utility grade solar, is more expensive according to the Public Service Commission and all of the studies that the utilities have used and all of the work that's been done for the solar that's on the grid today produced by companies like my own. It's minuscule in comparison to what we can do with a wind resource in Michigan. And uh, uh, now I have, I kind of forgot my train of thought on your issue, so I'm gonna have to pass it. If it comes back, I wanna come back to it. I guess I just wanna make one point on, you know, the legislative deal that got cut and, and the surcharges. So, A, 18 months of intense negotiation, 10 years of my life getting the legislature to pass the first 10%. Um, and then if you look at the surcharge, consumer energy surcharge is, is fair, I believe. But the legislative deal resulted in the DTE residential rate payers. They use 36% of the electricity and they pay 69% of the surcharge. So they're, they're subsidizing the commercial and industrial sectors inside of their territory to the tune of $20 million a year because of the way the legislature formed the legislation. So I, I would call it an imperfect process at best. Proposal three, I think, is much cleaner. All right, next question. A lot of these states up here have a renewable portfolio standard going through the legislature process. How many states have had an amendment like this attached to their constitution? Zero. None. What was that? Zero. This is the first state. So we would be the, the only state where businesses who are deciding whether or not to locate a renewable energy facility would have the certainty to know that we're not backing off. We're serious about this going forward. And, and I think, in my mind, it sends the right message to people that says, come to Michigan, you want to do clean energy business. So one more question from Commissioner Markowski, and then I'll be back for the very last question to that side. Um, could a few of you speak to the um, places that produce coal that we're currently um, getting our coal from? So the states that are producing coal, are we always getting it from within the United States? And what are the costs associated with that? And in jobs, if we stop doing it, and in lives, if we continue to do it, as well as the environment as to what it's doing at the moment? So the coal is not indigenous to Michigan, and I, I, I think everybody knows that. So we import the coal. The coal comes primarily to this state from the Powder River based Basin out of Montana and Wyoming. It is uh, an indigenous fuel for the United States, and it, it is in fact um, responsible for an awful lot of jobs. So uh, yes, there are costs associated with bringing that coal to Michigan, but I just want to keep coming back to this. Conventional power, which is the power that we have already built, are already maintaining, already using. We know the full-in costs. It is today cheaper than building a brand new wind and not knowing what it's going to be out into the future based on today. 
kind of, of course, we disagree there because today I think it's cheaper. But I, you know, I point out most of it comes from Western states. There are some still from Illinois, Eastern states. Um, I would note that DTE Energy actually owns two companies, and all they do is move coal from the mines to the Midwest. They have seven other companies that reprocess fuel, which they get federal tax breaks for, um, and that's kind of outside the whole ratepayer. So beyond the fact that they would lose a little market share if this was to pass, because the legislature in 2008 had a little provision that said the utilities should only, they, should, they can build half, but they have to buy half from other private sector people. I think the utilities are worried that that same policy might move forward, so they would lose a little bit, they would have to actually share some of their energy profits, the $1.1 billion they make every year from, from, from us, with other companies in Michigan. And those other holdings they have in the coal industry, I think are the financial reasons that the utilities are spending more than $20 million trying to defeat this. Quick counter, and then I'm going to also ask Tiffany to see if you might be a comment on this year. Uh, yeah, we, we would make money off of building renewable energy just like we would make money off of building conventional energy, <coughs> assuming that we did it well and the Public Service Commission agreed that we had done it well and we should get our rate of return on that. It is not about it. In fact, the uh, campaign, the proponents of the campaign called DTE Energy, called me specifically, and wanted us to come on board their campaign because they knew we would make money off of it. We are, believe it or not, very concerned about the costs that get passed on to our customers, to our business customers who create more business in the state of Michigan, and to our residential customers, all 2.1 million of them in our case. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I would agree that, that both consumers and DTE, they, they do well off of the renewable energy that we're doing in Michigan right now, and, and we want them to do well on that. Um, and, and then uh, I would agree with um, James's comments about, about the cost and, and uh, where, where most of Michigan's, uh, and, and Nancy as well, where most of Michigan's coal comes from. Um, and the, the only other thing that, that I would point out is that uh, because we're a peninsula state, that there is, that makes it all that much more sort of uh, um, difficult or um, challenging, and adds a slightly increased cost to delivering coal to Michigan. So it comes by rail, they put it on barge, they barge it over across the lake to us. So just a, a, a slight increase in the cost there as well. So the last uh, question of the evening for this formal portion, I'm going to give to uh, Mr. Jack Kennedy, and then we'll break for informal contact uh, with the panel. I'm just curious as to how the $12 billion was developed. Where did that come from? Any one on the panel? Um, you want to pick a so we had a lot of very smart people, I was not one of them, <laughs> who got together with public service commissioners, with utility people, and figured out what the current cost of doing renewable energy is today, and extrapolating that, looking down the road to the future by the year 2025 to build 25%, and that's what they came up with. Again, that cost is pretty conservative because it does not include things like transmission and what if the wind can't get built because of NIMBY standards, not in my backyard kind of standards. There are a lot of potential other costs that could occur. We don't know, but we thought that was a fairly conservative estimate and it was put together by, like I said, much smarter people who do the economics around the construction and maintenance and future of uh, owning and operating those than I am. So, so our figures are a little less, um, and it really, that number is just driven by what if you build wind turbines to meet the entire thing. I think we used a, uh, a $2,350 per kilowatt number, a uh, capacity factor of 35%, came out with $10.3 billion. So really smart people figure this out, and then they figure out how can we mislead the voters of the state of Michigan. <laughs> that they take 12 billion divided by 4.7 million customers and say it's gonna cost all of you $2,500. It's gonna cost you thousands of dollars to meet this standard. Ignoring a rate cap that would limit a residential rate increase to $10 a year. Um, 
ignoring the fact that if you don't pass this, of that $2,500, they're still gonna charge you $2,450 to supply you electricity. Um, our cost report came out with the fact that the, the, the transition to clean energy between now and 25 would, would cost your average residential rate payer in Michigan 50 cents. So thank you all very much. Um, <laughs>